Alrighty. So, first episode. Uh, we're doing paint to performance. So, we've got uh, Tom. And Hello, gentlemen. Myself and Dave. Hello. Um, I guess we look after more of the rehabs uh, component of uh, Performotion. Um, so, we're going to be going through, I guess, different conditions and different things that we see week to week. Um, and, and how we essentially approach them and, and, and sort them out so that way we can get these lifters and these, these general pop um, athletes back to doing what they love. Um, so I guess just a little bit of an overview of myself. Um, I'm an EP. Um, I've been out of uni for a few years now and just really, I guess, love doing the rehab component. Uh, Tom, what about yourself? Yeah, so I'm an EP as well. Um, I've been out for about five years now, I think it is. And yeah, I spend most of my time with musculoskeletal issues. So anything to do with like muscles and bones is, yeah, I find really interesting and um, enjoyable to help people treat. Cool. Um, so I'm David and I'm a student EP. So I'm in my second year, second semester. So I've got two and a bit years to go until I graduate. Um, pretty mixed at the moment between pain and performance stuff. So I, I do enjoy the, the rehab side of things with getting people out of pain because um, I tend to be a pretty empathetic person, um, but I also have a big passion for the performance side with powerlifting and other strength sports. Gassing people up. Of course. That's the tickets. <laughs> um, so I guess today's first episode, what we're going to look at is the shoulder and I guess common presentations and, and common issues that we see and, and how we go about treating them. Um, so I guess the first thing, what, what do we look for really, Tom, um, with our initial assessments when someone comes in with shoulder pain? I suppose like um, first thing about shoulders is like the coolest thing about them is they move so much. Like they move in pretty much every single direction, like both through the shoulder itself and the shoulder blade. So we have to consider a lot of different things, more or less starting from the rib cage and then moving our way down throughout towards the proximal arm. So I like to generally speaking with people with my testing, like start at kind of like gross movements where we're looking at their ribs then move towards how that's affecting movement of their shoulder blade, then moving towards how it's affecting movement of their shoulder, and then kind of moving from that aspect down there. And we can get a lot of information as well from how people say that their shoulder feels with movement or like movements around the house or movements in training, when they get the pains, like what sort of pains come on with what specific movements. Like there's a lot of information generally that we can kind of take from both the objective and subjective stuff. So yeah, I guess like that's a good place to start with for me. Yeah, cool. Uh, Dave, what do you typically look at? Uh, me, so I like to think about what they've been doing. So a lot of my performance guys, if they're just, you know, jamming lifts of powerlifting, it's probably going to be they're in a ton of depression because deadlifts, pulling the shoulder down, bench pressing, pulling the shoulder down, um, even squats, same thing. So I like to think about what is really common, so what's a common movement for them, um, and sort of where they're probably going to be stuck or where they're sort of leaning towards and what they might have lost. Yep. Yeah, awesome. Um, cool. So I guess following on from that, Tom, where, what, what assessments do you typically do when you're looking at the shoulder? Because I know you said you start at the ribs, um, but I guess, can you dive a bit deeper into that? Yeah, like, um, I guess one of my first and like favorites is just gonna be getting someone to touch their toes, just like bend over and to see where they bend in their spine. So like, kind of like what Dave was saying, there's a lot of movements that a lot of lifters tend to present pretty commonly with, like a big one being like stiffness. Like we get stiff in our shoulder blades being pulled down or together a lot, especially like with cueing of certain movements or we get very extended through our T-spines as well. So we tend to get a lot of stiffness through these areas. So like just getting someone to touch their toes first and foremost gives us a bit of an idea of where someone can bend. If they can bend, do they need to bend for the sport they're doing? Like some like, uh, I guess a good example is your um, deadlift specialist. If someone is really, really good at just relaxing their upper body, getting their ribs down, getting their arms really long and out and in front of them, and then they get tamed with their bench press, maybe there's something going on there in regards to they can't get into the position that is comfortable for bench press or produces like a performance component for bench press, like getting their ribs up, getting their shoulders down a little bit more, being able to actually like push their ribs up towards the bar. So a toe touch is definitely one of the first ones I'll look at. And then I'll start to move towards more of your classic, just kind of isolated range of motion stuff, like maybe your shoulder flexion, shoulder extension and going from there. Yeah, cool. Um, Dave, do you do anything different or do you see anything different I guess compared to what Tom was mentioning um I guess not really I probably do all the same things I if I've been working with someone for a little while I don't usually use the toe touch because I generally have an idea of what their spine looks like <laughs> yeah and how they how they move um which makes things a little bit easier when you have been working with an athlete for a while um same sort of test shoulder flexion shoulder extension I'll look at their the internal their external yeah um, even their ability to shrug or adduct as well yeah. um, and see 
I guess, what that range of motion looks like, if there's pain associated with it, those sorts of things. Yeah, cool. Yeah, that's good. Um, so I guess looking at common issues that we'd see, um, we, we'll go through, I guess, a few categories through the common issues, but I guess the first one that we'll try and rattle off is anterior shoulder pain or pec pain. Uh, um, yeah, classic. Nice, nice common one that we see a lot in athletes, um, both overhead and in powerlifting. Um, so Dave, I guess, where do you start? What's the common presentation? Um, pec pain and anterior shoulder pain. Well, I can speak for like from experience with anterior shoulder pain. <laughs> <laughs> I dealt with that a fair bit in the past, and that was pretty fun. Um, for me uh, personally, and what I've seen as well is sometimes it can be uh, people losing the ability to internally rotate. So they lose the ability to actually turn their arm in and internally rotate. So instead, their body tries to find it by shrugging the shoulders up. Um, and whether that's because they're jammed so far under depression. Um, that they've sort of lost this range of motion to internally rotate. Yep. Um, so that's a big one that I usually see is people stuck in depression. Um, their body's trying to shrug them to get them into some internal rotation. Um, and then that just leads to some flare ups in that anterior shoulder pain or even into the trap as well. Yep. Um, so doing something to try and get the scap moving again, sort of encourage some upward rotation and get the trap sort of being able to work properly again um, seems to be pretty, pretty good for sorting that out. Yeah, sweet. And Tom, I guess do you think anything different or add anything onto what Dave was mentioning regarding anterior shoulder pain? I guess it's always the hardest thing is because everyone kind of gets different variations or versions of their own pain like everyone feels different sensations or um, different areas so I guess like um, when it's coming to like the anterior shoulder pain side of things you want to look at where and when they are getting their pain like if it's a bench press related shoulder pain do they feel it close to lockout or do they feel it when the bar is close to the chest? Because it's going to have, like, I suppose, like um, different sort of um, reasons as to why maybe that shoulder is getting sore in those positions. Potentially, like an anterior shoulder pain when the bar is close to the chest could have something to do with not having enough shoulder extension. Especially if you have quite a big arch on a bench press, that could be a reason that your shoulder feels beat up when you are close to the chest. Also as well, like I guess for those people that get more sort of pain with your incline pressing or your overhead pressing or you don't have as much of an arch on your bench press, potentially that's something maybe more towards like to do with external rotation of the shoulder or not being able to upwardly rotate the shoulder as much. So it is always hard to say because everyone's shoulder pain is different, but it's very much like looking at where they get the pain and when it comes on um, and what sort of causes those issues, especially when it comes to being under load. Yep. So I guess... Following on from that, I know going back to uni um, or what we were taught in uni, they'd always sort of allude to anterior shoulder pain being caused somewhat by the long head of biceps. Mm. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, what, what are your thoughts around that? Uh, like I feel unless you've had like a direct injury to the actual long head of the biceps, it's probably not going to be the long head of your biceps. There could be a lot of other um, causes or reasons for why you're feeling pain in the front of your shoulder. But yeah, like the long head of the biceps aren't going to be usually like the cause of that anterior shoulder pain unless, you know, you've had something yank it out of the arm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I guess in terms of, of that now, I guess relating from what, what you originally would have thought regarding anterior shoulder pain to what you know now, would you say that there's a, a big discrepancy between the two? I guess, yeah, compared to sort of what I went through with uni, like a lot of the time, like when I was still like first learning a lot about the body, it was... Um, may, might have also just been around the same time that I was kind of going through, but <clears throat> excuse me, like it was very much good movements, bad movements. Like there was always going to be like movements you should avoid, you know, these movements cause impingement, like those sort of phrases. Upright <laughs> rows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, that's, that's just not the case. Like every movement the body can do has a, a reason for it to be done. Like there's times and places that you might want to be doing it. And there's definitely positions that are stronger or better for certain tasks, but there's no movement that is inherently bad like I have some people with shoulder pain like or like trap pain shrugging like they're like just traps away like they're just doing shrugs on shrugs on shrugs because their trap pain comes from work capacity or like a positional related thing to do with the traps even though traps are often like vilified as being a muscle we never want to train I guess it's the same with um you know internal rotation of the shoulder as well or even just like bringing your arm across your body into those like conventionally more internally rotated positions. Like there's a time and place. If you have someone that's in the complete opposite position and the task requires them to do that, we need to find a way to help that person achieve that position. Yeah. So yeah, it's very much, I don't believe in the whole good and bad positions anymore, just a time and a place for specific positions. Yeah. I guess, Dave, going through uni now yourself, um, is there sort of 
a bit of a, I guess, almost a learning curve between what what we do here versus what you're being taught at uni? Yeah, 100%. So um, it seems to be a little bit more standoffish from what I can tell is um, like the whole like do no harm kind of thing is like your first rule as a practitioner is very like driven home. So um, I don't even know how to, how to say this properly, but it's basically a very like slow and steady approach and yep. sort of like quite conservative yes very conservative and like you never want to um, I guess almost back yourself if you have an idea of what's going on um, take the conventional approach you know do your banded external rotations ah uh, yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah do your 3 by 10 banded external <laughs> rotations and it'll get better you'll fix be right. all shoulder pain yeah basically um, but we actually haven't done too much like it's very interesting with uh, the degree that we still do a bunch of testing, so we learn how to do a bunch of testing but um, and use diagnostic tools, but we can't actually diagnose or we don't actually use them that much in the course anyway, so it seems mm. kind of kind of odd in that way, Yeah, um, if that makes sense. I think, I mean, in my opinion, I think that the diagnostic tests are quite good because they paint a nice picture uh, as to what's going on through that movement, but at the end of the day, the test is going to test what the test will test. So if you're looking for, I guess, Bars. literally, <laughs> so if you're looking to cause, I guess, or, or see for some form of impingement, I guess, with a Hawkins Kennedy sign, right? That's going to be an uncomfortable position for anyone to really be in, especially oh, being sure. cranked into IR at 90 degrees there. Yeah. So if you're looking to elicit some impingement, you're definitely going to get it. Yeah, um, if you want to find impingement, you can find it. <laughs> yeah, 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 you can find it. Like, I mean, I guess like we were doing this morning, you can almost make yourself have symptoms of bursitis without having bursitis. Oh, yeah. Like, if you just try and lock everything down as much as possible, you can reduce how much space you've got in the shoulder. 100%. Easily. And then you cause impingement, and then we go back to the banded external rotations. <laughs> yeah, that's your medicine. <laughs> um, cool. So, I mean, that, that's really good, covering, I guess, anterior shoulder pain um, and pec pain. But looking at, I guess, the lifting side of things, where, where do we go from there? So, once we've done our assessment, what's sort of the next step in terms of prescribing exercise for potentially um, what the person needs yeah like I guess um, graded exposure is always going to be the most important thing getting someone back to as much full function as they can um, so like assuming someone has like taken time off a lift because of aches and pains and they've got to start slow we've got to try and find a way to like start to integrate that movement like as soon as possible into like their training program again which is always going to be um, like, different for each person depending on how much function or how much pain they experience in that movement. So the way I like to structure as much as possible is I'll try and move someone into those movements or movements like those movements as quickly and as safely as possible and use as many sort of like, um, not necessarily drills, but I like to call them more just bodybuilding accessories to allow the like the, the client or the, the athlete to like feel like they have more space to get into those movements. Yeah. So like maybe it's getting them to do some rowing before their bench press if that helps them get their ribs up. Or maybe it's getting them to do some tricep work, like some kickbacks to help them get a little bit more shoulder extension before bench. Like often using like a, a bodybuilding accessory as a bit of a warm up drill to then help them feel more comfortable for that like barber lift. Yeah, awesome. Um, so I guess the next one that we'll try and break down is trap and neck pain. So that, that I know is you know, quite common through a lot of people because a lot of people are quite desk bound and sedentary. Um, so it comes up quite frequently, I've found. Um, I guess, what do we typically see with presentations there, Dave? Well, I think this is similar to what Tom was touching on earlier, was like, the traps can often be vilified and be known as like the, they're overpowering and they're always <laughs> they're on. So they're always strong. doing yeah, everything. Yeah, you're so stressed, your shoulders are so high. <laughs> you and carry like, your traps, stress in your traps. Yeah, yeah, your, your shoulders are always up, your shoulders are always super shrugged, therefore your traps are getting sore because they're always working super hard. Um, and sometimes that may be the case, but I don't think that's always correct. And I think that's where assessment is super, super important, is seeing how the client's presenting. Because everyone's going to sit differently. Everyone's going to have activities outside of their sedentary desk job that's going to affect, um, I guess, their, their movements and how they're actually sitting, like, I guess, posturally when you do an assessment, how yeah. much ROM they have, those sorts of things. So um, I don't know if I can give, like, a broad scope answer of what's going on, but I think it's, like, it just highlights the importance of the assessment tools you use to figure out what's actually going on there. Yeah, yeah, cool. Would you agree with that, Tom? Yeah, definitely. Um, and like those assessment tools being like those like more specific tests we were talking about, or even just using, you know, like 
sometimes just stuff like static posture can be a little bit of a snapshot into how someone moves it's like obviously we move outside of those static postures but it's just a little bit more information the more information we yeah. can grab on how someone moves and the movements they like to do or the movements they need to do the more we can paint that picture on how we need to help that person to achieve whatever task they're trying to do yeah because i guess static posture um when we're looking at at that as an assessment it's sort of just depicting where they're standing in space at that time hey yeah definitely yeah. and how their body can i guess give themselves the best center of mass so they don't fall over backwards <laughs> yeah. or forwards yeah. right sometimes it's just like trying to do it the easiest way possible yeah um i guess things things you've typically been taught at uni with upper neck upper neck and trap pain uh, sim similar to what dave was saying where it's just like a, we want to try and like reduce how much elevation but um, yeah, it is very much case dependent. You'll have some people that they feel like, um, you know, training their traps brings on headaches and migraines. Sometimes that can be, you know, it's a work capacity issue for traps and the traps feel like they don't ever get trained. Because I mean, especially with some powerlifters, like when was the last time a powerlifter directly trained their traps? Apart from, you know, just stretching them with something like a deadlift. Yeah. Like it's, well, if we like often like look at other muscles, sometimes it's, it's interesting just to kind of compare that like you know biceps and triceps we're always considering taking them through a full range of motion but we don't often consider taking through yeah normal muscles like your traps like through a full range of motion it's it's just like yeah it's something to definitely consider with the case by case so um yeah like conventionally a lot of the time it is going to be once again just looking at that task so if someone is going overhead they may need a little bit more like shoulder elevation than normal someone spends the entirety of their life in depression they might need a little bit more elevation yep. then you've got the other hand maybe some people do need to work on a little bit more like scap depression scap posterior tilt because they are one of those people where the shoulders do stay raised up and they are shrugging like 20 times a day just yeah. they train a lot of it yeah breathing with their traps <laughs> breathing with yeah. their traps just everything <laughs> coming up mm -hmm. yeah um I guess in terms of how we incorporate that into a lifting side, so say for example, I know Dave, you work with um, a few Olympic lifters and, and strong men and things like that. So how does that integrate if, you know, if some, for, say for example, they're, they're coming to you with uh, one-sided track pain? Um, well, I guess like, again, first you'd start with the assessment and see what's actually going on. Once you've got that, um, to me, it's as simple as just throwing in a warm-up drill or exercise to start with, just to open up and give them some range to move into, or just throwing it into their accessories and just, yeah, like Tom said, just masking it, being like, yeah, let's get big. Bodybuilding. Yeah. <laughs> throw in the bodybuilding work and whatever exercise it is, you know. Um, you might throw in, make it higher reps, so the, the load's quite light, therefore, you know, you're not spiking anything, you know. Two sets or something like that doesn't need to be heaps. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But yeah, just like sprinkling it in and hiding it almost. So the athlete actually has no idea that this is now rehab because a lot of people have this blase attitude to rehab but if you mask it or hide it and say that this is just bodybuilding this is just part of your program yeah. push your accessories etc then they're probably more likely to get after it and actually do the work properly and, yeah. and then <laughs> yeah. get the results that we're looking for to get rid of you know said pain yeah exactly right i think <coughs> if we if we cue it to be not rehab but <coughs> Sorry, not rehab, but do it to be actually like, you know, this is just another exercise or another, another accessory that you need to do to, to improve your performance. I think you get a lot more buy-in from athletes doing yeah, that. Yeah, correct. Um, just to like, I guess, give a little bit more specific answer when you touched on like the weightlifters or strongmen that I have. Um, I do have someone that does have one-sided um, shoulder pain on one side and does go into the trap. Again, like we've touched on, it's just that one side doesn't like to elevate. Yep. So for him, it's something to get that uh, shoulder blade, you know, um, upwardly rotating get a little bit of a shrug on and then it usually fixes up that trap pain as well in between sets I even get them to just do like set to 20 body weight shrugs just moving up and down get the shoulder blade actually moving upwards yep. and that seems to do a great job of clearing it up as well so it's a super simple way of like in between warm up sets do a little bit of shrugging and it, it sorts them out so yeah sick that's pretty good. simple um, so I guess going going from here um We've got some, I guess, what we what we three like to call the keys of, of shoulder rehab. Um, and I guess, Tom, start us off with some keys of shoulder rehab. What would be, I guess, Big your... Keys. <laughs> what would be your go-to for shoulder rehab? Um, I guess, I know it's quite quite broad, um, but what would, your, what would one of your go-tos be? I guess, um, don't be afraid to train full range of motion to a hard intensity. So, um, <clears throat> train your arm behind your body really hard. Train your scaps in an elevated position really hard. Train like train positions you don't spend a lot of time in, especially in your accessories with intensity. That way you'll get stronger in there, you'll feel more robust in those positions. You'll often make sure you have the space to move into those ranges of motion. And yeah. it's fun. 
Yeah. Get them <laughs> jacked. Fun, yeah. Get them jacked. Dave, what about you? What do you reckon one of your keys are that you take a lot of your clients through? Uh, so this one's a hard one because the whole thing is like, if I have some athletes or clients to work with that I work with, specificity is obviously a, a real thing. And to get really good at things, you need to be doing them all the time. So I think variability can be huge within accessories. So you might not change every accessory uh, block to block or whatever. You might have some key things that people need to keep in their programs. But yeah, not being afraid to you know explore and venture into other I guess, unconventional accessories that will expose people to those positions that Tom touched on. So not being so obsessed with, oh, I did this one exercise last block and my bench went through the roof. I'm just going to keep doing it and doing it, doing yeah. it until you get stuck and then, you know, you run into this wall. Yeah. So having some kind of variability within a program and, yeah, not being afraid to be attached to that one accessory that did well in this block, you know, that sort yeah. of thing. No, yeah. that's sick. I think, I guess, from my perspective, a big thing that I've taken away from shoulder rehab and everything like that is just get everything moving the way that you feel like it needs to or the way that you see that it needs to because um, as we've touched on you know it's, it's typically going to be relating to either the ribs or the scap not moving as well as it could so if we can get the scaps and or the ribs moving as as they should um, right versus left side then we're typically going to see um, everything moving and then feeling a lot better and stuff will feel good exactly right if we move well things feel good yeah yeah oh and train your arms please train your arms yeah. like that is one of the best things you can do for shoulders it's just training big. arms in various positions just get big rich piano <laughs> arms and we'll be sweet eight hours anymore <laughs> Awesome. Um, well, if you guys have any questions or, or want to send us, um, I guess, any further information regarding shoulder pain or anything like that that you may be experiencing, feel free to send us a message uh, via Instagram or send an email and we'll be able to reach out to you there. Thanks for listening. Cool. Sweet. Cheers.